Good? Mm -hmm. All right. So the first thing that I want to do is talk about uh, the last four chapters, the two chapters that we read for this week and the two chapters that we read for last week. Obviously, we won't go get into a lot of detail given we only have a little bit of time uh, here today. And then the second thing is the last introduction of a faculty member, Dr. Stanley. I know most of you have either met him through your scavenger hunt or uh, have met him because he's your advisor. Um, and, but he's going to come and introduce himself, just like the other faculty. He has a 2 o'clock class, um, but he is arranging his class in such a way that he is able to come for the last part of the class and introduce himself. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so let me begin um, by uh, opening up in general. Uh, were there any things that were really interesting to you about the chapters for this week or last week that you thought would be interesting to, to share uh, together? Yes? I think his whole idea about how creativity is, a, is like a skill that you can train somebody to do. Uh -huh. Like you can train someone to be creative. Like growing up with like a Abbey Arts background and like music in high school, it was like, oh, these kids just naturally can do stuff. Uh -huh. And it's like that idea of you can learn how to, you know, think creatively was something that was never, I was never exposed to me. That's a new idea. I never thought about it. Uh -huh. that way. Uh -huh. How how many uh, people have that same experience? That that was a new idea for for you. Okay, I would say about half of you raised your hand there. All right, maybe more. Um, how many people uh, felt like that, uh, I don't know, I'll go either way, felt like that made sense to them? Like, yeah, I think I could be, learn to be better creative. But raise your hand high for this one. I feel like I could be taught to be more creative. Okay. How many people felt, no, that doesn't, it, it's kind of, that's the way it is. And, okay, okay, okay. Uh, why? Either side. Why do you think that you, yeah? Um, I would say, like, there's not necessarily a side. I think everyone can kind of be taught, like, a creative aspect. But it's just, I think some people start off with more um, than others. And I think that's, like, the way they were raised or, like, what they did as a kid. It's, like, just a functioning, like, brain. But I think everyone can grow in their creativity, but I think the people who started off with a higher creativity end up still being like more creative because they just had like a head start, but like everyone grows in their creativity, I feel like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think along the similar line of reasoning as that. Like I think it's this idea that there are some people who who's like especially in like a technological field, like there's a lot of things that happen in high schools where arts programs and things like that get budget cuts because they want to invest more in you know STEM classes like your maths or sciences stuff like you know engineering and things like that um, because um, it's better for your career like you'll be able to get a career better if you focus on technical things as opposed to creative ones. So I think there's, because of that, like, imbalance in people, like, I think you can develop creativity to a certain extent, but, like, some people inherently have a more creative thinking mind. So, like, with math, you can get better at math by practicing a ton, and you can get to roughly the same level as somebody else, I just think, because of how, log how logically, you know, math is set up. Like, there's rules, there's concepts that you can learn, gradually, progressively get better at it. Like creativity is a skill that you do by doing more of it, but some people's brains, I feel like naturally, are more susceptible to being more creative. Like, I think they can think of things faster. That's why the art field is so, you know, subjective, because there's people who are, maybe are creative, but don't necessarily become successful. And math seems like if you study for a long time, you can make yourself successful. 
but for, for you to be successful in a more creative field, people, people have to see and appreciate your creativity and then lift you up on their you know, subjective opinion about your creativity. Other responses? Yes. Does he say it's a skill? I don't. Yes, he does. He does say it's a skill. It's like a man, man, it is. Man is a um, so that, that would be in his creativity chapter, so chapter 25. And I think it's early on in the chapter. Uh, um, where he. he I agree that it can be improved. I don't know if I would categorize it as a skill. Okay, why not? It, can be it just doesn't sound like, that creativity doesn't sound like something that you'd be skilled in. What does a skill mean? A skill is an aptitude for, or being skilled at something. I would say it is a skill. I could argue that it is. It's so unmeasurable. Mm, yeah, it? it's not measurable. Like, well, it's hard we, to yeah, it's hard to be a good measure. archer, and people would be like, he's skilled at archery because he can hit X number of bullseyes from X distance X number of times. But like, with creativity, I think but like what other skill? But you said it, there's an aptitude toward right. Like, yeah. pick a creativity in in any discipline. If we want to take arts as an example, and you went to someone who. You, you could say that this person has more aptitude in writing good songs, writing good music, drawing good pictures, um, being able to sculpt better, right? So there is, there is aptitude that you can as ascribe to these creative arts, I think. Measuring it is, is difficult, right? And, and it, there doesn't have to be necessarily a 100% agreement about just because I think this person is good does not mean that other people think that that person is good. Maybe if there's some sort of a consensus, a lot of us think that that person is good, that tends to show higher level of creativity. I don't know. I don't know. I think also it's harder to define creativity because in like, like a job application, say like for like a, like a this is just like a how they have like people that decorate like uh -huh. all shopping malls, uh -huh. like on like a job application, like their requirement would not be uh, you need to be a creative person. The requirement would be you need to be able to decorate this mall well, which comes with that creativity. So I think like as Jane said, I don't think I think measuring creativity is impossible. You can met. I think I would I would maybe say it's possible. You can measure. I mean, I'm not drawing. You can because you can measure like the goodness of a drawing versus another drawing, but you cannot measure the amount of creativity it took to make this drawing versus the amount of creativity it took to make this drawing. You can measure the goodness of the thing that's being created, but the creativity behind the thing. Being created. So the so the head is Emma first. So uh, mine's kind of divergent. So. Oh, okay, Dylan. I was going to say, I don't think creativity can be measured at all. Because if you think about creative, creativity as in like a trait, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a skill, more, more so rather a trait. Because if you think about creative influence, most of the time it's actually just um, things that we've learned somewhere else from something. So creativity, in essence, is more of like, um, like a trait that you're getting that's derived from things you've experienced. And he kind of goes in the chapter to talk about um, how creative, creativity is really impacted by experience. Um, and I would say it's more, less, of a, less of a skill because, I mean, sure, you can fine-tune creativity, but to be skillful is something that is, is by nature defined as other people can identify um, that that's skillful. Uh -huh. Now, like Jane said with the archery, anyone, and, and anyone that understands archery to the degree of what archery is can understand that someone hitting a bullseye from 100 meters away 10 times out of 10, that's skillful just because it's hard to do. Everyone knows that. But when you look at like a Vincent van Gogh painting, you can't measure the degree of creativity because you don't necessarily, haven't lived his same ex, like life experiences, so you can't qu quantify how 
how that is skillful versus just a trait of his mind working through that. That makes sense. Okay. I love Hamming's uh, definition of creativity as the ability to bridge ideological gap. Like the larger the gap between two things ideologically, uh -huh. the larger the amount of creativity which yeah. inherently defines creativity based on culture. So like the fact that people know what archery is, well, actually, that's I, not, yeah. like Earth, like the fact, like when we think of Earth, we think of Earth being round. That's because culturally we've already bridged that gap between like the Earth as a planet and it being round, which wasn't, didn't always exist. And back when that wasn't a common cultural accepted fact, that was creative. It was a creative idea to think about the Earth being round because the gap between like spheres and the planet Earth was large. That's it. But it's very small now. Planets and spheres are very connected. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was kind of my. I, it was That's actually weird. more of a question because I, I was thinking about it. But I guess my main thing is, do you think like even you or whoever feel like computers are ever going to be able to be at least some degree creative? Because I feel like us like what he was saying like. I don't, regardless of whether you can measure it or not, creative is not copying something. Like, if you can draw a perfect picture, like it's exact photograph, you're not creative. If you like can take someone else's design for a building and you just copy it and rebuild it, you're not creative. The whole point of being creative is doing something that nobody else has done. But at the same time, we don't like generate ideas. I mean, we might think we do, but like, we never just like. I mean, some people try, but like, they always take. From something, even if it's just the picture of you know a square, a white, a black square on a white canvas, you knew what the square was, you knew what black and white was. Like you just took something and did something that nobody else was expecting. But I feel like a computer could do that because he can take analogies. It's just it's just increasing that gap to a point where us as humans would acknowledge that and say, wow, that was that was a it was a major cross of disciplines to take the quadratic formula and apply it to icing on a cake. You know that's that's a huge shift in disciplines, and therefore you were creative because you're you just did a sine wave on the case, but you you crossed the discipline. Right. And I feel like if you have power in a computer, you could do that. But that's something I'm uninformed about. I feel yeah, like. I think we're kind of that question kind of circles us back around to an earlier question, like what can what does it mean to think? What is it for 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 an AI? Yeah, John. I feel like we could program computers to be creative because I feel like so much power comes creativity or the level it is now is a result of how much we fostered it as kids or how much it was suppressed as kids and also our experiences um, and our personalities and our home life, all of that mixing into if we're more drawn to a different reality or creating a new world or creating different ideas and so I feel like Giving a computer those experiences or those scenarios and almost giving it a, a character identity would allow it then to be creative in the sense that we're creative. Because I feel like we don't just, like being creative isn't just coming up with something out of nowhere. I mean, it's a unique abstraction of all these different ideas and experiences into what would seem as something new or um, original, but it's really just a huge collage with extremely little pieces. Yeah, no. I was going to give a response more so to Sodia. Okay. Um, I'd say the argument that you can make saying that you can make a, create, a computer creative is essentially by nature true. Just because if you think about it, you can give a computer uh, a dictionary of a billion items or ideas and have the computer randomly connect something and it, and it have some common basis of why it connected. That's creative. Um, now, the argument of that versus is that idea novel? I would say it's not novel, but it is creative. Novelty comes from something being like created in the first instance that it has. But because you're having data where that creative idea is created upon, um, it won't be novel, but it will be creative still. You know what I mean? Like for in the book, it talked about um, Mendeleev, Mendeleev's uh, P practice. Mendeleev's P practice was novel. Um, even though that the researchers that created the same um, or got the same information out of their experiments didn't know about it, they thought it was novel until the fact that they knew there was already information because of that, like before that. So once they figured that out, they knew that they, what they did was creative, 
but it wasn't novel because it wasn't the first instance that information came. Yes, yeah, except that Mendel, Mendel didn't invent pollinating people in it. Like, he took something and then did something that was unexpected with it. Yeah. But people knew how to breed pea plants before that. He just wrote it down and said, wait, I can draw connections from that. Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. He found, he found the information, though, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but he took it from things he had already had. Yeah. And made something that nobody else had. But yeah, he knew it yeah. didn't he invent that. To get back to like the definition that Jaden read, right? he connected right. ideas. We know how to breed plants. We know that plants have characteristics. Oh, there's a there's a specific reason why that gets passed on through the genetic traits, right? Why does why does this matter? Why does being creative matter in our discipline? Yeah. Because it feels like so much of like what a computer does is so hard coded, or there's only limits to that, and so making improvements or having new ideas was such a, a mathematical or, or people, some people think a, a like stuck in stone um, field like we have to be the creative ones we have to be the ones to um, use this tool to go beyond um, just like writing algorithms that can calculate things faster okay. yeah I think also to, to kind of connect you know, faith and learning and stuff. I think ultimately, um, in this discipline, we're creating things. Like yeah. even even if even if we're you know making things that like checkers in Cos 120 is a thing that already exists. Like checkers was an already established game that was already been created. But us taking that concept putting it in a computer, logically coding it out, we're creating this program. We're creating this thing that reflects something that already exists. And similarly to the way that we are allowed to create because God created himself. So we are allowed to create computers, and we're allowed to create programs, and we're allowed to create you know, these things. Or we, we are encouraged to, in fact, because you know, we're reflecting God's image. Similarly to how we're reflecting things that maybe already are established. Like, Dr. White knows exactly the way he wants us to code this checkers game so we can learn the concepts. But he is in turn reflecting something that already exists in the way that we're reflecting God's image through Yeah, so because if, if it's not true now, it's going to be true very soon that we're going to run out of our ability to think of ways to write computer programs. And before, or like, instead of computers not be able to perform those programs, like, we're going to have enough processing power pretty much pretty soon if we don't have it already to do whatever we can think of. But we're still going to encounter problems that we can't actually think of programs to write for. So then somebody that has, like, we're basically going to have to make a program that can write a program. And have, that program has to be cre more creative than we are, or at least think of ideas that we want, that we don't have the mental capacity to think of. Or else we're not going to be able to solve those problems. We're going to be Are you saying that? Our, I think he's saying that we're going to be limited by our minds, not our yeah. computing power. Right. I, we might be at that point now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Aren't, won't we always be limited by our computing power? Every time we've like increased our computing power, we've thought of like ideas and concepts that we just don't have enough power to, to visualize. Except that you can think of a different way of computing it. If you, sure. if you were smarter. The point at which, like, we won't have maximum computing power until we can know the exact location of every particle everywhere. There, there are problems that we already know how to formulate yeah, that are unsolvable, yeah. given infinite amount of computing power. Yeah, we could write it. Well, not infinite. Given finite amounts of computing power. Like what? Like what? Like I, I, I gave a, an example when I was describing the algorithms class last week. Remember where I said a simple problem of saying the input is a program. And the, and the algorithm is tell me whether this program stops running. Yes or no? 
I, I like feel like I, I like sit down and like make that happen. Like that's how easy it is. Yeah, seems. I want to know why. That's how easy it seems, isn't it? It seems so easy. But it's uncomputable. Yeah, yeah, because if you if it detects that it's over, it's not gonna tell you. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm sure you, you it, we'll, have to, we'll have to look at I don't. Proof. I do not want to go through the proof. It's an advanced proof that <laughs> we're not ready to, okay. to talk about. Sorry, but, but right, and I hate to say this, but trust me, you cannot write a program that <laughs> will detect all possible programs that uh, correctly. Um, you can um, you can write programs that will catch some program that will catch many programs, okay. but it will not catch all programs. Okay, so it's okay. it's an absolute. Yeah. Uh, another example uh, is um, there are a huge class of problems that we do not we do not think are solvable. We can't prove it yet, but we do not think that they're solvable. They're called MP complete problems, um, and there there are a whole uh, range of them, um, and they they go um, a lot of them are like what I just described where they sound simple to solve but then if you want to write a program that can solve all possible inputs there are just these really interesting corner cases that take too much time to, to solve so um, they, yeah there there are problems that we will never have enough computer power to solve. I was, I was saying even more like with the quantum, the quantum computing or something, like he was saying, I, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of advancements have been made since he wrote that, but like we might, what if we like weren't able, like physically, with our human brains, no matter how smart we were, uh -huh. we weren't able to come up with an uh, uh, idea that merged general relativity with quantum uh -huh. But there was actually a theory that had that, and if we were able to make a divergent enough computer, he could actually come up with a theory that would make us be able to understand that. That, that is a goal of some artificial intelligence um, the, uh, researchers, is to be able to develop an intelligence that eventually would exceed our own. Yes. Um, uh, the concept is known as the singularity uh, because the, at, at the point where computers are more intelligent than people, what happens? There's, you could have a dystopian kind of viewpoint where you say, why would the computers bother to keep humanity around anymore? Or would they treat us like pets? Just like, uh, because we see ourselves as superior to, to our pets. We don't see their thinking capabilities as equivalent to, to ours. Um, would computers do the same thing and kind of relegate us to zoos? Or, you know, um, or would we become their s servants or slaves because they see themselves as being the masters of, of the universe? And, and us as serving their needs rather than the other way around. So that's a dystopian uh, understanding of what the singularity would look like. Um, you could see it as uh, more like what you discussed, Sodi, where we kind of come together and try to learn from, from each other and improve both um, the artificial, intel artificial intelligence um, and the naturally uh, in intelligence to, to make our lives combined better. Yeah. Except that, like that, assume the dystopian would assume that the artificial intelligence was able to come up with its own ambition, which I don't see how you could do that. Like, like, so the thing that separates a human from a chimpanzee is that the human was able to say, "I get rained on, and so therefore I'm going to build a house," whereas the chimpanzee, like doesn't see a house in the nature, so he all he can do is just hide under a leaf or something. Like, we were able to to create a different thing because we already had that ambition of, I want to stay dry, I don't want to get wet. But uh, artificial intelligence, I don't, I, so I'm dumb, I don't know anything, but, like, I don't see how you, it could just come up with, oh, I want to rule the world now, or, like, like all it needs is power. That's all, that is only 
core drive, if it even has that as a core drive. So like you would still have to have the human say, do this. But then you, in theory, could have like something like Skynet or something like that that does what you were trying to do, but just does it in the wrong way. Like make global peace, and then it just kills everybody because then you have global peace. But like I don't see how it could just come up with its own drive because it does. It's not biological. But maybe that's. Did I see your hand up, Jade? Yeah, I I don't see it. like if you make something that can just continually evolve, like and give it some sense of purpose, the purpose will evolve. But that would still be up to you to determine what that initial purpose is. Yeah, but so whatever the initial what is, purpose is, if it has the ability to modify 100% of its own self, it can modify its purpose. Sure. Yeah, but that'd be through like a process of rationalizing. Like, mm -hmm. it talks about how humans are rationalizing beings. If you take a monkey and give it a purpose of trying to stay alive, it's just going to look for food. The purpose never really changes, it just knows that it needs to stay alive. Mm -hmm. They're not rationalizing why they're trying to look for food. Just because they're hungry, and they know that if they don't eat, they're gonna die. Now humans, we we have a mind that allows us to rationalize and say, "Well, I want food. Well, it's gonna keep me alive at stage one, but at stage two, now I'm eating food because I like the food, not because it's just the nutritional value of it." So, like computers, if it doesn't, if, it, it's, if it's not structured in a way that allows it to rationalize like us, it won't evolve its purpose. And yet, if you put several types of nuts on the squirrels will only eat one type of nut. Well, yeah, it's because that's their environment. That's the nut that was most apt to be um, given to them, or like for the but common I don't nature. Know that I mean, I feel like they still have like uh, feelings of pleasure. Well, maybe, but but they can't act in a, in opposition to their their core drive to eat. Like they can't refuse to eat the nut because they want to give it to their friend or something. Humans are kind of unique in that, I feel like. But maybe that's not. Like, like, we can actually change our core drives. Like, our core drive is not to survive anymore. Because there's people that just <laughs> don't survive. There's people that are suicides. Like, we don't have, like, we can actually completely alter our core drives. And I don't, I feel like that's a uniquely human. I don't know how that would ever be programmed. Can we alter our core drive? What is our core drive? What is our core drive? No, that we because we like we have yeah. like martyrs and we have like people that like monks that don't eat and don't have like don't have sex because they don't reproduce. Like it, it's completely anti-evolutionary, and yet it happens because we have like ideals that we live for. Yeah, because yeah, consciousness, I think, is what you're getting. Yeah, but like I'm able to say I want to promote communism, and so I'm going to do whatever We're, it takes, even though it's stupid. We're the only ones who can resist our core drive. I don't know if we can change our core drive. We can go against it, unlike animals. But like, but I don't think like we can. Hitler's make, core right? drive was to dominate the world. Huh? Hitler's core drive was. To was dominate that his core drive? What is some of his core Guys, drive? is there even such a thing as a core drive? Why are we so obsessed with this? Everyone has the same core drive. What is it? Like it's the, it's like the from Star Trek, uh, the what's that called? Prime Directive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's okay. Let's, uh, your Watch reason for Star Trek. <laughs> no, not your reason for living. Your reason. So why, why do we care about, uh, let's bring it back again, why do we care about creativity in computing? Why not just do, why, why do, how many people either have had this feeling or have had someone tell them this feeling that it, there is no creativity in the computing field. I'm shocked. I, I, I am shocked. You will definitely encounter it then. Okay. There are people who do not think of computing as being creative. They might think of it as being uh, following rules or setting up rules or processes. Okay. Yes? If, those, if uh, following rules and uh, setting up rules don't count as creativity, then what about board games? If you create things like board games, is that not being creative? Because you have to come up with all those rules, and I think that's creative when you make a good board game. 
but you're doing pretty much the same thing in programming, although with different goals. I think that's a great response, Esther. Uh, I don't think everyone has a that uh, perspective. Yes, you, you get yeah. to finish it up first, Trent. Yeah, I think to, to go along with that too, like there's, I think we just have this societal, um, you know, prerequisite of this left brain and right brain idea of like there are left brain careers and there are right brain careers. You know, there are things that require more logical thinking and there are things that require like all logical thinking and or all creative thinking. And I think, you know, our, our society works in absolutes a lot of the time. So, okay, computer science, okay. Uh, on my high school uh, course thing, it's listed as a math class. Okay, so that must mean that it's, you know, a logical class. Like, it's like everything is that. So we immediately have our predispositions about that whole thing. And, you know, obviously, if you don't look into it, that's what you're going to believe. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to just say it's important that you understand that you can improve. There's this idea of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Um, and one thing that, that psychologists have, have studied is when people think that your skills are, are fixed and kind of like this is where what you were born with and you have a certain aptitude at which you can achieve that, um, that um, you live up to that expectation internal to yourself um, and that what happens is you go along in that discipline until something gets hard and you're like okay that must be my limit I'm, I'm not able to push be, beyond that and that's what that's what I was born with but if you have this growth mindset where you understand that you can develop your skills, your aptitude, and learn to improve, when you hit these barriers, you instead of saying, well, oh, that's what I've met, I've met my match, you, you have the, the inspiration to say, well, this is where I'm at right now, but if I learn, if I talk to others, if I figure it out, I can go beyond this barrier and continue to improve and, and, and continue to get better. Um, and that's the mindset that we want you to instill with your this creative uh, mechanism, this creative outlook, um, because that's what will allow you to do well in, in our classes here. You will, I guarantee all of you, will come across some barrier while you're here at Taylor. And you, if you have that fixed mindset, you're going to have a really miserable point from that point on. Because you're like, I, I just, I'm, a, I'm not there. I'm not going to be able to make it for the rest of my time here. Or if you have that growth mindset, you can say, oh man, that was hard. I'm going to talk to my prof. I'm going to talk to other people on my wing. I'm going to talk to upperclassmen, whomever it is, because I want to break through this barrier and, and succeed and, and be able to express my creativity um, in, in figuring out how to solve that problem. Uh, I don't want to take any more time because I asked uh, Dr. Stanley to be here today. Um, and so, um, as you uh, all know, um, I've asked each of the faculty members to introduce themselves a little bit. So I'll move out of the way here. Um, Danny, I am recording this because I do have a few students who are quarantined. Okay. Um, but um, can you uh, maybe can it up that way so there's not pointed at my stomach? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm Dr. Stanley. I, uh, this is my first time ever wearing one of these, but I figured since I was going to be trying to get to know you and you get to know me, that you can see my face might be helpful. Um, so I feel kind of awkward behind it, but I think it's a little bit better than this. Plus, I don't want to hide this glorious beard. Uh, if you could do me a favor, though, if you have a laptop, could you go ahead and close it up? Uh, this is a, you don't have to take notes over me. I want to get to know you a little bit. so. Uh, maybe we don't have that barrier between us. You can ask any questions you want as they come to your mind. I'll start from the beginning. I was five pounds, seven ounces. Just 
kidding. That's actually how much I weigh, but we don't need to go back that far. Uh, I was an undergraduate in 19, the 1990s, and I was architecture major. And I didn't catch what precipitated the discussion you were having about logic versus creative, uh, but I'm a creative type. Um, I like I was good at math too, so that helps. Uh, but I was an architect, architecture major, and so I worked with paints and models and not like supermodels, but like you know, building things with my hands, right? Uh, and so I, I I enjoyed kind of uh, I enjoyed working with my hands very much. I enjoyed putting things together, figuring out how things worked. Um, and so then I got I got a computer to do CAD on. That's computer assisted drafting for architecture. This was back in 1995, I think, ish. It's a long time ago now. Um, and I started goofing with it. I started playing with the computer. I had uh, Windows 95. It was fresh operating system then. And uh, and I uh, about the same time the internet or the web started to hit universities. I visited a friend uh, at IU, and uh, he had to go to class. And so, oh, by the way, I went to Ball State University for my undergrad, which is just that way, a few miles. Uh, I went to IU to visit my friend, and he, uh, he had to go to class. So he said, hey, you should hang out in the computer lab while I'm in class and use the web. And I was like, what's the web? Uh, and so I discovered uh, I discovered the internet and the web that weekend, and kind of changed my life. Uh, I was already goofing with the computer for CAD, and, and I discovered this thing called the internet, and I thought it was pretty amazing. And so I was like, I should take some computer science classes. Well, long story short, I changed my major to computer science, uh, and um, finished undergrad. But about the same time, uh, the dot-com boom, and maybe you've heard of it. Uh, it was, wait, how, when were you born? What year? 2002. Oh, man. So this is like before all you were born. But then there was something called the dot-com boom, uh, where uh, everybody was eager to get on the internet and make tons of money. And, uh, and lots of people were making a lot of money. And so I started a web-based, or a, uh, a software development company and we did a lot of web applications uh, for businesses, trying to move their businesses online because it was all the rage and they were going to make millions of dollars, right? Some of them did, but not our customers. Uh, well, maybe. Maybe some of them did. Uh, but I started a business with a guy in my dorm. Uh, he was a business management major and I was a computer science major, so we were a pretty good combo. Uh, I also was pretty entrepreneurial when I was in undergrad. Um, I had my own fireworks store. Oh yeah, I sold fireworks. And I uh, made like 15 grand in six weeks or something. So that was pretty lucrative. Uh, it was a good summer gig. But I had this kind of uh, entrepreneurial bug in me and, and so starting a company was pretty fun. Uh, and it's still in operation today. The name of the company is SpinWeb. Um, I sold out my part of it in 2003 or so. Uh, maybe it's earlier than that. Um, but we created websites, web applications. We connected uh, web pages to databases, and uh, it was a lot of fun. My second favorite job, my first favorite job, was being a professor. But my second favorite job was having my own internet startup. Um, I did everything. I like defended our servers from getting attacked by attackers, uh, and I shoveled the sidewalks when it was snowy. Right, so I had all kinds of uh, responsibilities. We had about 14 employees that I employed and paid them good salaries and everything. So it was a it was a lot of fun. Well, there was a dot com boom, and there was a dot com bust. Right, so everything kind of fell apart, and uh, and business wasn't as good. And I wasn't having as much fun, and so I let my business partner take the take over the company, and I moved on. I've worked at I don't know how to count them. Some of you uh, interviewed me for your project, and so I don't know how. To, so I'm gonna give you a different number now. Don't worry. 
I don't know how many companies I worked for. Because I was a consultant, and so I worked for a lot of companies as a consultant. Uh, sometimes I was uh, on their payroll directly, and sometimes not. So, but I worked at uh, multiple software development companies, and was in management or leadership in most of them. Uh, and that was pretty interesting, until it wasn't anymore. I love computers. I love computer science. I love programming. And uh, what I found was, for me, and this isn't true for everyone, but for me, uh, business computing uh, got a little shallow after a period of time. Uh, I was done kind of exploring to the depths that they would pay me to explore. Right? They just need things to get done for a business. They don't need me to research how the technology works, which is what I wanted to do. Um, so I kind of, after a few years, kind of got a little bored working in business. Um, my brother said, my brother's still in business, and he graduated from this program in computer science. Uh, and uh, he said one time, there's only so many ways to get information into a database and out of a database. And that was kind of his way of saying, sometimes it gets a little uninteresting. Um, now there are, lots of there are lots of parts about business that are very interesting, so I don't want to throw any shade on business uh, because you may find that that's where your passion is. Uh, but for me, I really like digging deeper. I really like diving in to understand how everything worked. I wanted to understand that. And so I went back to grad school in 2006, I think. Um, and then I got a master's degree from Ball State in computer science. Uh, and, uh, and I thought that was going to be it, but I took a research class and I thought that was pretty interesting because uh, people pursue this deeper dive like I wanted to do uh, as researchers, and I thought that sounded cool. And then I went to a conference and heard a guy speak named Eugene Spafford, and he's commonly known as Spaff, and he's a professor at Purdue University. I heard him speak, and I got inspired. Uh, what he was talking about was really like meeting me where I was at. Uh, as I mentioned, I had this dot-com startup, and uh, a and in that time there, I was kind of the uh, chief technology officer. We, you know, when, I had, when I had 14 employees, I was one of the owners, so I got to make my title up. So it changed <laughs> some. But I was kind of in charge of the data center, all the servers, the technology that we were using, all that stuff. Uh, but one of the things I encountered along the way was our systems got attacked a lot. Your systems get attacked all the time. You just don't know it, um, especially if you're out on... Uh, if you uh, don't have a firewall or uh, network address translation in between you and the internet, uh, there's lots of kind of wholesale uh, simple attacks that are going against the network. But I discovered this and uh, had my, my own personal machine was rooted. Uh, what rooted means is that somebody had full access to my machine. Uh, that happened and I felt a little bit, uh, what's the right word? Violated. Violated, there it is. I felt very violated. Um, I had been running a version of Linux that had a package, I think it was Bind maybe, that had a big vulnerability in it. I didn't know anything about it. Like I didn't know anything about security really. And, uh, and so two things happened. I hope felt very violated was the first reaction. The second one was, Holy smokes, how does that work, right? How did they do that? And that kind of started my interest in security, uh, computer and network security specifically. And uh, so when I heard uh, Gene Spafford speak about security, so he uh, is in the, uh, what do they call it, Cybersecurity Hall of Fame, whatever that means. I mean, where, you know, I don't know how prestigious that is, but I think it's pretty prestigious. Um, but he also has been on like presidential councils and things like that to, to advise of the US government about computer and network security. And so I thought, man, he's doing some cool work. Uh, he's a pretty uh, charismatic speaker. He's pretty interesting to listen to. 
um, and so I got kind of inspired. And so instead of staying with my, just my master's degree, I decided I wanted to go for a PhD and become a professor, and I wanted to study under Gene Spafford at Purdue. And so I applied, and uh, for whatever reason, they accepted me. And so I went to grad school at Purdue, um, and that was the most painful and most rewarding thing I've done in my life, I think. Well, with the exception of like probably my kids and family kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, it really allowed me to do those deep dives that I was interested in. They paid me to go to school, like it was free. So you should go to grad school. Uh, some of the classwork that you take here at Taylor is going to be similar to the classwork that you take as a grad student in terms of its how difficult it is. You think, hey, grad school, oh, that's going to be super hard. Well, you're only a freshman, so you don't know this yet, but some of your classes you're going to take here are pretty challenging. Uh, and they're not that much different sometimes than some of the work required at a grad school level. And so most of our students, I think, are pretty well prepared to go to grad school. Uh, what I enjoyed about it was being able to do those deep dives, but also it taught me a lot about myself, uh, where my limits were. Oh boy, it's really uncomfortable. Um, maybe you're feeling that now as freshmen. Maybe you don't know much about computer science yet. Maybe you're seeing other people in your class and you're going, holy smokes, they know way more about this stuff than I do. Well, some of that's just they've been exposed to it more. Uh, some of it is that we're all gifted differently. Um, I really like math. I'm a creative type person. Uh, but there are parts of computer science that are more challenging for me than others. Um, and so I remember studying with this guy at, at Purdue. Uh, he's very, very bright. He was very gifted intellectually. And I studied all weekend for this final in my algorithms class. And I think I got like a B minus or something. So I was pretty proud of that. This guy came to our study group and he stayed with us for an hour. I worked on it all weekend. He stayed with us for an hour. And he said, I think I got it. And this guy aced it. He got 100% on this final. And uh, it was like, uh, that's not fair. Part of it was that he had, he had taken some other algorithmic kind of, kind of classes and other theory classes that had helped him. But also, he was just gifted differently than me, right? And you're all gifted differently than each other. Uh, computer science is wonderful, because I think it's a big tent. It has room for all kinds of giftings, all kinds of uh, people. Uh, if you're uh, maybe not the type of person who just likes to spend all day with a computer, uh, maybe you like computers, maybe you like programming, but you're kind of a people person, I assure you, there are plenty of jobs you can get with computer science degree where you work with people, especially software engineering positions. Um, if you're a creative type person, uh, there are lots of ways to apply that, but maybe digital media or computer science cybersecurity, which is the major uh, that I kind of created here at Taylor, well, with help from my colleagues. Uh, thinking sideways about how software works is kind of a creative process. And so figuring out how to break things, how to cheat on video games, how to, you know, all these kinds of fun things, takes a bit of creativity. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And am I over time? Are we supposed to stop at 2.50? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I took us over time. Uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes. If you have any questions, we haven't had a chance to have a conversation. If you take one of my classes, you'll know that uh, I typically don't lecture for 50 minutes at a time. It's more of a conversational kind of class. Uh, and so it's a little awkward to just talk at you for, for 15 minutes and then leave. But uh, feel free to come up and say hi. All right. Let's thank Dr. Stanley. I do have uh, a homework assignment posted for next week already to go, as well as next week's reading assignment. So make sure you do that. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue our discussion from there. All right? Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>